Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the apocalypse engine. I'm your MC, Rich, and I'm joined by my special guest, Brandon Leon Gambetta, the guy behind Stop, Hack, and Roll and Protean City Comics, which is an ongoing Masks actual play podcast. In fact, he's like the Masks guy. Hey, Brandon. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Rich. I am an enormous fan of Plus One Forward, um, and I've, I've decided I'm going to embarrass you right off the top because I have actually done the thing where you're listening to a podcast and you pause it and you like talk out loud how you would talk <laughs> when you're on the podcast. <laughs> You've got that level of fame that I'm like driving in my car and pausing and going like like two years ago, pausing and going like. Uh, yeah, uh, my, my gateway game to Powered by the Apocalypse is... Uh... That's great. Well, I guess I can go ahead and segue right into how long have you been playing PPTA <laughs> games and what was your gateway, Brandon? My gateway was Urban Shadows. Nice. I found my way to it while it was kickstarting and just immediately was obsessed with it because I had a long period of time that I very much wanted to play Vampire the Masquerade and couldn't convince anyone to do it. Mm. And then I realized that that was because I don't care about the rules. And so I would start to describe it to people and say like, oh, it's this cool thing. And people would go, oh, can you play like a werewolf and a vampire in the same thing? And I would go, eh. and it's like, oh, and what are the rules like? And I'm like, ah, not, <laughs> not good. This was just a perfect way to have kind of the cake and eat it too. Nice. And uh, you might notice that's a magpie game, and I'm wildly excited that I am now publishing with Magpie Games. That is pretty cool connection, man. Congratulations. Way to reach for the stars and grab that brass ring. Oh, it's been like a true dream. I'm walking on sunshine. I'm in the in the final episodes where everything's coming together. Nice. Well, let's jump on over here and read a sitch. Read a sitch. On Rita Sitch, uh, we have our guest talk about a journal of play or some aspect of playing Power by the Apocalypse games. And Brandon, I am really excited. The thing that you want to talk about. Now, we have done an episode about making custom moves, but what you mm -hmm. want to talk about is a little more specific. Yeah. It's uh, making situation-specific GM moves, like, I don't know, monster, playset moves, and then GM moves for specific NPCs. So tell us, Brandon. Unlock your brain and all of this uh, experience you have with PTA games. Uh, what, what are you thinking? So I'm like low-key obsessed with just the structure of GM moves. I love that they are so specifically narrative, like mm -hmm. most of the time, and that they can do so much heavy lifting. And the examples that I come back to when I talk about this kind of thing is Dungeon World and Masks. Because Dungeon World, you've got all your monster moves where you can have something that you're fighting a monster and it does D6 damage and it's like, all right, who cares? Or it can say, like, bite off a hand. And that is fire. Mm -hmm. And likewise with masks, you can have someone, like, you know, hit you and you mark a condition. Or you can have them, like, send someone into another dimension. <laughs> and I think as GMs, we... And like as GMs and as game designers, we sometimes don't pay enough attention to those moves and instead like build out the character and then just use like the core GM moves that are from the book. And I, I want to see some more like things where people are getting creative with what it means to have that rule at your disposal. And ironically, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of that in passion. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You've done, you've done so many interesting things with conditions and rolling with questions. As I think about those like GM moves, one of the things that I've had a lot of success with is specifically in Apocalypse World, which are kind of environment moves. Mm, yes. And I love them because, and this is not Environ from Apocalypse World Burned Over, which is another awesome, cool thing. Yeah. But not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, uh, like, I had one Apocalypse World which had acid rain. And so there was a custom move of if you go out while it's raining without protection, roll to see how bad things are. And mm -hmm. it impresses upon people that 
confined spaces and not being able to go out and the boiler room feeling that I yes. want in that setting that has that external pressure. Yeah. What are some specific GM custom moves that you've really enjoyed? Ooh, there's one. This actually is a pasión move. Well, there we go. This is this is just like you were saying, like a custom move that's in a setting. Mm-hmm. And so this is near the pool. When you when someone attempts to strike out at you or demand what you deserve while by the pool, you may immediately mark a condition to throw them into the pool and escape their wrath. If you do this, they may immediately mark a condition to drag you in with them. <laughs> so, like, the reason that I love that is that it tempts people. And so, like, that's, that's where I see these custom move opportunities and go, like, hey, as a GM let's get those moves those things that are in our back pockets and make sure that the players know about them Mm. because if you tell the players hey if you get into a fight down at the pool you might get to grab somebody by the hair and drag them in then they're gonna do that and like if you tell someone hey if you go outside in acid rain it's gonna be a major issue then they start thinking of that as a distinct thing, right? So mm-hmm. they're, they've got someone like held up in fisticuffs and they're going, how can I drag them out a door mm-hmm. to like mm-hmm. make this like really hit? And so like, I feel like having, like what I would love to see is someone taking a bunch of custom moves, a bunch of GM moves, a bunch of different like setting specific things and just having them on note cards on the table everywhere so that people can go, Oh, like it almost forms like a map of what you're looking at that you're saying, Hey, when you're here, these are things that can come up when you're here. These are things that can come up and those could even be used to do GM style moves, like in the same way that a goblin can bite your hand off. Uh, You could put Mm -hmm. like when you're in the underground surgery lab, that's secretly underneath the hotel, you have the custom move that a knife is within range at any point. (laughs) <laughs> and so you just tell the you just tell the players that and you say hey just fyi when you're down there where people are getting their illegal surgeries to hide their identities you can always reach a knife it's just like an invitation to the players i think it's interesting the way you're phrasing it because pbta is a powerful genre emulation engine absolutely right? that's, that's the thing that i feel like it does best and so the playbooks are often archetypes within those genres and really what you're saying is this these opportunities that you roll into a custom move are environmental reflections of those genres Mm, yes yes like here's the cool thing that i see happening in a lot of telenovelas in this particular place well let's mechanize that yeah like this let's put out some risk to it so that we're not freeform dealing with that particular aspect of the genre but it's a it's a thing out there's an offer Mm -hmm. but it's also a bit of a risk I, i really like that idea i think that's a cool approach because to me sometimes i'm like i really need a custom move here how do I frame it? Yeah. And the, and the frame is to just kind of dive into your genre and think about what are the cool things that could happen or what's an aspect of this environment that is screaming out to be pulled into the story or, or to, to be involved. I like that a lot. I want like a Rolodex of locations and situations mm-hmm. that I can just like put on my table and just go like, all right, we're playing masks. Someone is, uh, one of the heroes goes alone into an alley. And I just like, you know, go, all right, uh, there is a mugging and we're doing that move right now. Nice. And just like having that, there, there is this very strange thing that has happened with PBTA games that they are a step away from trad games in terms of their opportunity to have really cool supplemental content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that, and that doesn't exist, right? Like there are like Monster Hearts has a whole bunch of playbooks. Uh, Apocalypse World has some playbooks. Masks has an enormous playbook creation like space, but you don't see people publishing like, "Hey, here are fifty masks, magic items," mm-hmm. right? Like you don't see people going, "Here are twenty rituals for Monster Hearts," and I think that that is actually a missing thing in how we can look at games because the custom move is interesting not because someone made it up on the spot but because it's an interesting move for that specific situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think Dungeon World did a good job of capitalizing on this. There are a lot of Mm third-party, really great Dungeon World supplements. Yeah. And then it just, like, nobody else is 
leaned into that. Yeah. The best third party you get, it's just like you said, like there's extra skins for Monstars. Like mm-hmm. Fahrenheit Games has some really, really, really great stuff. But like, I would love to see more play sets and I would love to yeah. see kind of more of the Halcyon City stuff for masks where they've got mm-hmm. location specific moves and situation or period specific things that are going on. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for that. That's People are leaving on the table there. It's, yeah. This like low key. The play sets from Passion are partially me going, hey, here is an invitation for you to do the work of sitting down, writing a couple custom moves, writing a couple of NPCs, and putting it out there for people. Because I think a lot of people are intimidated. And they go like, hey, something is either a move, like a basic move, a playbook move, something like that, or it's a custom move that I need to make up right on the spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just inviting people to have a thing that says, hey, this is two pieces of paper. This is a little bit of setting. This has three moves on it. And this is useful, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I, I want that so badly for so many games. <laughs> yeah. When, when it comes to that, make up a great custom move on the spot in the middle of the game. I get hives, man. It's a, it's it's a lot. Tough. It's tough. It's a thing. People tell me that I can do it. And they don't hear the 15 minutes of us pausing the recording <laughs> for me to like desperately write down like seven different things that don't work before finding a move that almost basically works a tiny bit. Oh. No I revealing hate. trade secrets. Do you have any particular tips for things that you do when you're coming up with a custom move on the fly? Are there particular places you look at or do you just look at that? That traditional six minus, just leave it to GM moves, seven to nine, mm. you get kind of what you want, but not exactly. And and 10 plus is all you want, which is kind of the most boring <laughs> custom move, right? But, but yeah. like it's a thing. So what tips do you have for trying to make those custom moves on the fly? So what I always try to do is I use, there's a basically like a structure that I come back to almost every single time. Like mm-hmm. if I am doing a custom move that I'm writing ahead of time, that I'm sitting in my office and going like, oh, wait until they see this, <laughs> then like, you know, I'll use all sorts of different forms. Form factor and moves is another thing that I could talk for hours on. But I have found that if you make a simple three option move that you on a seven to nine pick one, on a 10 plus you pick two, and you make it so that one of the things is basically avoid immediate fallout. Mm-hmm. One of them is immediately get a thing. And one of them is immediately get something that isn't the thing that you necessarily wanted, but is also a great thing to have that you've got like 90% of your move. Wow. That is, oh, that's a nice template. I really like And then that. like on a six minus, I try to make it, I, I like to give a specific six minus for custom moves. Mm -hmm. And I like to make that harder than kind of a generic hard move and also weirder. So you're only going to get this bad thing if you hit this move kind of deal, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like something like I I recently did a game of masks where we had someone uh, combine their identity with an alternate evil version of themselves because of the (laughs) custom move. Okay. Uh, and it was it was dope, and it's something that I wouldn't have done on just any generic six minus, right? Because that would be a bizarre thing to do to just go, yeah, you uh, accidentally portal through part of an alternate dimension, and uh, your identity is subsumed by the evil version of yourself. <laughs> but like by saying to the player ahead of time, hey, this is what it's going to be, then you've kind of got that excuse to turn things up in a really huge way, right? That's really then cool. Then they chose it. They they did the thing. Good. I would I would be embarrassed if they chickened out. It was it was so fun. <laughs> that is really cool. Well, gives me a lot to think about, Brandon. Thank you for that template. That that is a thing I'm gonna basically have on an index card that I sneak into my GM bag. <laughs> awesome. Glad to hear that. Well, this is this is pretty great. Talking a little bit about Passion. So why don't we jump on over here and open our brains to this game? All right. Open your brain. On Open Our Brain, our guest talks about an Apocalypse Engine game or mechanic if they aren't a designer, but luckily Brandon has a game for us. Pasión de las Pasiones. Yes, it is. Nicely done. Thank you. No one but me and you know that was like the fourth take. (laughs) It was not the fourth take. That is an exaggeration. Pasión. What is the setting for this game and what's it all about? Pasión is a genre emulation game. And so the setting is a little bit 
washy at times, and that kind of, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, I guess, but it is a telenovela game, and the intention is to give the experience of sitting down and writing and playing and being present in a telenovela, which are Spanish soap operas that are known for being very, very intense, very dramatic, with the twists and turns everywhere. People say that they sit down for an episode and it's like, oh, every episode is a finale. And that is very much the feel that we're going for, is just this intensity of of romance and drama and emotion. Nice. That sounds really, really fun. Uh, uh, for us uh, Mondays, are there any touchstones on like major broadcast TV that would fit in that telenovela mold? Absolutely. Uh, there's uh, English ones and Spanish ones. Do you have preference between them? Oh, I was just saying, like the Mondays. Like a, I think if you say telenovela to someone who's Spanish, they like know you. But oh like, yeah, Midwesterner person, American, you know, <laughs> Mexican. What what would you point them towards that they could go look at on Hulu or broadcast? TV? Oh, there's so many phenomenal ones. Some of the big kind of classic ones are Marimar mm-hmm. and Maria La del Barrio and Cuna de Lobos. Oh huge one that actually that made it to the states with a uh with an interpretation that i admittedly haven't seen i've only seen the original is uh yo soy betty la fea which became ugly betty oh oh okay yeah ugly betty was uh, one of the first times i had heard about telenovela very cool All right there's also been a whole lot of kind of big ones that have hit netflix Reina del Sur or Queen of the South. Mm -hmm. That might actually be Hulu. I don't know all the brands from each other. But that is a really kind of like intense cartel sort of based one. You know, Ugly Betty is very light, very comedic. Mm -hmm. But additionally, there's Jane the Virgin, which is kind of a deconstruction of telenovelas at the same time that it is a telenovela. I think High Seas is maybe a little is a little telenovela. They definitely don't want to be categorized that way. But like it's got (laughs) all the beats. So there's there's a ton, and I, I think we're just going to see more and more of them coming to mainstream United States culture because we've got a big Latinx population explosion, and we want to bring the things we grew up on. That sounds fantastic. All right, so Passion. Mm-hmm. What mechanics are different in this game versus Apocalypse World? One of the biggest changes with it is that Passion de Pasiones is statless. So instead of having, like, your hot and your cold, you instead have questions. And every move that you roll, you'll roll with three questions. One from your playbook that's always asked, which is basically asking, are you staying on genre for your playbook? And two others that are from the move, which ask, are you setting things up narratively in a way that would benefit you in a telenovela? Hmm. For example, with uh, Strike Out at Someone. It's not asking, hey, do you have a bigger weapon? It's asking things like, have they just wronged you? Because it doesn't really matter if you have a bigger weapon, because this is a telenovela. And so what Mm -hmm. matters is if they just hurt you so deeply that you need to get them right back. (laughs) Nice. That is really cool. Other than that, the moves work essentially the same way. We additionally have conditions, which are kind of like the conditions in masks, except that they have both a positive and a negative, and they're unique to the playbooks that they're on so instead of everybody being able to mark angry you might have raging lustful righteous dogged defensive driven and they're they're all over the place and so they really encourage you to think about how your character feels emotions so you get like oh these are my four that i mark and those can eventually be changed with advancement but it means that when you're sitting there as a player you're having the experience of saying, when my character marks a condition, they're probably ending up more dangerous, more angry, versus someone else sitting down and saying, when my character marks a condition, their instinct is to go try to find love and try to like find someone to protect them. I really like these conditions, especially that it's a it's a plus to one thing and a minus to another. That is cool because it it creates this situation at the table. I had the joy of playing this game at Origins a couple of years ago, Mark Diaz Truman ran it, mm. and I saw that, and it just 
blew my mind. I'm looking at <laughs> wait, I kind of want the conditions. It's not like masks where I'm like, the conditions are going to make things terrible. And I have to do a, a really nasty <laughs> thing to get out of it. But this is like, ooh, maybe I really want to be obsessed. Yeah. Because I can accuse people of lying and be better at it. That's that's really neat. And the, the thing that we really wanted to strike with that and the, that I really wanted to strike with that is that you should be feeling emotions. So, like, you don't want to be a telenovela character that has no conditions marked, because that's not the point of telenovelas. So you're tempted to mark more and more of them, and then you can you when you fill them up and can't mark anymore and have to mark again, you go into meltdown where you get to go do something just to really shake things up, and so it just keeps this kind of treadmill of conditions and emotions and meltdowns and conditions and emotions and meltdowns. That's awesome. That is really, really awesome. Thank you. Because there are so many different kinds of telenovelas, we also wanted to make it easy to set up different settings for them. Because, like, telenovela isn't so much a genre, right? So we use playsets, which are basically little two-page setups that include a couple NPCs, they include a custom move or two, they give you a bunch of setting information, and it sets you up with a show right from the beginning. It's almost like a little mini module, Mm -hmm. but... You're, it doesn't tell you, like, where things go from here. So it tells you, hey, we're doing the Ranchero one, Corazones Despocados, and that is about a farmhand that comes back from the dead, apparently. And <laughs> so, like, you know, he's arrived back, and, oh, his lover used to be here? Who's going to be his lover? And, like, you you make all your connections, and you start things out, and you know that not only are we going to be on a ranch and doing some cowboy stuff, we're doing that with the background of the kind of plot that is really good for that kind of setting. Nice. That's really cool. Those plots that sound really fun and flexible. Oh, here's a question I have. Yeah. Is this a one shot game? No. Yes and no. So you can absolutely play it as a one shot. Okay. And that is secretly like a little hook that you trick people into thinking that you can do it as a one shot mm-hmm. because you can. It'll work. You'll have an awesome time. And guaranteed you'll have people going, okay, but wait, what happens next? Because this is a game that makes enormous amounts of loose ends. And so the idea with the game, and actually something that we have some systems for, is to lead you from the beginning of your story all the way through your telenovela and get you to the end. And we just, we say, you know, yeah, you can do it as a one shot and you can, you'll have a lot of fun. But our hope is that you get to the end of that one shot and you are losing your mind wanting the next episode. Because that's, that's what it should feel like. Because that's what it feels like when you sit down and watch one. Absolutely. Now, with Apocalypse World, the general knowledge or the general mm-hmm. belief is that it's like six to nine sessions and is, is the meat of when things yeah. get really good. Is there something like that for uh, Passion? It depends a little bit about your group. Mm-hmm. Because the game is designed to really kick off and get that feel of starting out like four episodes in. It has a lot of plot set up at the beginning like in your character creation you front load an amazing amount of relationship setup Mm -hmm. and an enormous amount of problems and issues that are going to happen and those are all embedded within the playset or within the playbooks but the core idea is to make it so that you are starting out where things are already over the top (laughs) where things are already extremely intense you're not starting off where oh someone made a threat against somebody you're starting off where a body was found in the middle of a table. <laughs> and so, like, we're going. What can happen with Apocalypse World and with a lot of other PBTA games is that they do get better because you basically get to the plot. Like, in the first couple sessions, you're aiming towards the plot and you're working out your characters and everything like that, which is completely fine. But for this, you can have characters that are a little more instantaneous Mm -hmm. and you don't need to spend a day getting to know them because by the archetypes, you already know them. Like I tell you, Hey, this person is playing El Caballero. They're the now loyal good guy who with the dark past and they solve their problems with their fists. And you don't need a whole lot more than that. You've got a character, right? Like you're ready to go. And so the first thing to do is make sure that El Caballero has problems to solve with his fists and problems he can't possibly solve with his fists. <laughs> and then you're into it from the beginning. Nice. That's my hope, at least. I've seen it happen a lot of times. All right. Brandon, what is your favorite move and why? This is such a hard question. 
there's two that I've really been going between, and I'm just going to choose one right now. But I'm going to say real quickly and sneak it in. Accuse someone of lying plays with narrative truth Mm -hmm. and introduces the possibility of taking something that we know is true and going, nope, never mind, it isn't anymore. But I'm not going to talk about that one. (laughs) Instead, I'm going to talk about express your love passionately. So when you express your love passionately, roll with the questions. Are you dressed to impress? And do they believe that you're single? So if you answer (laughs) yes to... Sorry. It's just nope, all good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was are you single for a little while and then we realized that, that was not nearly as good as do they believe that you are. <laughs> so you get a plus 1 for each of those. Uh if you can say yes to it. And then you have a plus 1 potentially from your playbook question. And then the rest of the move, on a hit your target gives themselves to you or reveals a secret they probably shouldn't. On a 10 plus, they also tell you whether they love you or not and who else they love. I love this move. Because it is a drama engine. It points players at each other and players at NPCs so quickly. And there isn't a level at which things don't get significantly worse in your situation. But everyone wants to do it all the time because it's the point of the game. (laughs) That is really, really cool. Okay. Well, I'm glad you chose your one move and that was a good choice. Yeah, my one move that I chose. (laughs) Sorry, Rouge. I'm not going to get invited if I make another game. (laughs) (laughs) You just need to make another game and then we'll discuss it. (laughs) Okay, sounds good. (laughs) All right, this has got me pretty excited here. I would really be interested in uh, playing Uno Mas. What do you think about acting under fire and getting this thing uh, out onto the table for a bit? Uh, You know I would love to. Awesome. It is time to act under fire. Under Act Under Fire, we get a little bit of AP demo. Uh, Brandon's not used to running games where they're recorded, so everyone be generous. <laughs> I'm joking. The guy has like a bajillion episodes of Protean City, and it's amazing. So thank you. I am very stoked for this. Oh, I'm so good for th- I'm so excited for this as well. Cool. I will be playing Uno Mas. Is plus one, but I added Spanishness to it. As well you should. That's one of the rules of Pasión de las Pasiones. It's actually in the rule book that if you are not playing Latinx characters, you're not playing Pasión de las Pasiones, and you've you've made a game hack to it. You've changed the rules in a fundamental way. All right. Yeah. Rock on. All right. So what do we need to do? What's our play set, and, and uh, how do we go? So I was thinking that we would go with the uh, Rosa Carita play set. It's not like a core playset necessarily, but it's one that is pretty accessible. Mm -hmm. It is a little bit aimed towards just being something that you don't need to have an enormous amount of pre-knowledge for. There's definitely some playsets that will seem a little, like playbooks and playsets, that will seem a little stranger Mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with telenovelas. I've had a lot of people ask me, is La Pirata a playbook that makes sense? And the answer is yes, because there are pirates in so many telenovela shows. (laughs) And that sounds like that sounds like a lie, but it honestly isn't. So to keep things simple, La Rosa Carita, it's a hotel playset. It is in the quick start. So if you have that, you've got the availability of it. And I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'll introduce a little bit of it super fast. Just a little bit of the text that we have from it. And then let's dive into some real drama. Let's move forward because this setting, La Rosa Carita, is a perfect one to have a big wedding problem. All right. La Rosa, as it is most often called, is a posh upper-class hotel nestled in the cliffs above a crystal clear bay. The hotel is lavish with white marble, beautifully lined mosaics, and seafoam green backsplashes. Enormous twisting pools circle the hotel with bars dotted along the patio. The elite come to La Rosa, not simply to sleep and dine in the finest accommodations, but to rub elbows, make deals, and further enrich themselves. It is among this finery that our story unfolds, the fine crystal and shimmering chandeliers offering myriad reflections of the sins that most make us feel alive. We start off with an exterior shot of La Rosa, and we're out by the pool, because you gotta have things start out by the pool, right? Of course. There's a couple people that walk by in just like scant little swimsuits to start things off, get people going like, ooh, this is gonna be one of those fun, sexy episodes. And then we get our first shot of Unomas. What are Unomas's pronouns? He and him. Sounds good. So we've been following his story for a little while, religiously, obviously. 
And he is, on this day, not at the wedding of his love. His love is going to be marrying the dreadful Jefe. I hate him already. Yes, El Jefe is Alonso de Marco Rodriguez. And he is just, he's terrible. He's the worst. What are your lover's pronouns? I think pronouns would be she and her. Cool. So we see Unoma standing outside for a moment, and then we just zoom inside to where there's like, there's a beautiful little chapel. It's, it's like maybe a little kitschy, but just great colors, beautiful diamonds hanging from the ceiling. And your love, Teresita, is standing there and just looks pale and worried. But her family is all around her, and you know that soon Senor Rodriguez is going to be there, and he's going to marry your love. <sighs> Nomas, why don't you tell us a little bit about, like, how do you look in that shot? Of course Nomas is troubled. This is the worst day of his life. He's been waiting for this, hoping that something would go awry, hoping that she would come to her senses. But Teresita is beset by her family, and Unable to go where her heart must lead her, which is to me. Absolutely. And it's not looking good. She's going to walk down that aisle, and you know that that will be it. That she is someone who is loyal and caring. She's not going to marry someone and then turn things around. This is the kind of t- thing that the ring touches that finger, and we're, we're done. So, Masuno, what do you do? I'm going to make my way over and try to pull her aside, speak to her. If, if Perhaps if I show her my heart at this last moment, she'll have second thoughts. So you're, you're heading down the aisle of the chapel and her father steps out from one of the pews and gets in front of you. He's a tall, relatively well-built guy, uh, but, like, you know, he's, he's in the, the generation above our main characters. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, he's, he's got, like, a tiny bit of gray. Other than that, looking just totally fine. Of course. Like, wonderful. <laughs> like, if he weren't in the telenovela, and he would be, like, the hottest guy in the room. But here, he's the, the old man dad. Of course. Uh, and he holds up his hand to you and he says, Masuno, what are you doing? Senora, I must speak with your daughter. It's urgent. You are going to get her and everyone else in here killed. Of course not. I would never put you in physical danger. I only want to talk to her about something to do with the Hefe. And you think that he'll allow that? You think that he'll just let you come in and steal his bride? You know I'm no happier about this than you are. Ah, senor. You must understand, Teresita, she is going to her grave here. She will die of loneliness and a broken heart. Let me save her. Go ahead and roll to act with desperation. So the way this works is you have a question on your playbook. Mm -hmm. Your question as Masuno is, are you playing Pasión dos Pasiones? (laughs) Yes! That gets you a plus one. Yeah, so you're at one so far. And then when you act with desperation, we're telling the MC what situation you want to avoid. And you're going to roll with the question. So you want to, like, avoid getting stuck up with him, right? You want to get past. I don't, I, I want to avoid having to punch him. Even better. Yes. Oh my god. So are you doing this for love? Absolutely. Excellent. That's plus one. Are you doing this for vengeance? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. Go ahead and roll your 2d6 plus two. I rolled a seven plus two. It makes it a nine. So close. Oh, very nice. So on a seven to nine, I'll give you a worse outcome or an ugly choice. And I think here's what I'm going to do. If you push past him... You're going to get, like, a minute with Teresita. You'll get a, a chance to, like, really talk to her for a second. If not, and you, like, try to talk your way through this, then you'll get to her. But you'll get to her right as Senor Rodriguez comes in the back door. I'd rather stay a step ahead of the jefe, so I will shove her father aside. He stumbles back and, like, bumps into the pew and ends up, like, recumbent on it. And Teresita looks up hearing that sound. She's looked almost in her own world until you come close. And we get this scene that just has a little bit of a soft camera on it. And she just immediately grabs onto your shirt and says, You shouldn't be here. Neither should you. But I'm so glad that you are. Teresita, 
come, let me take you away from this. You do not need to marry the Hefe. My motorcycle is just outside. But how can we do this? Just You want to just run forever? What, what life could we possibly build? We will build a house made of love. I will give you all the children that you want and need. Hefe, this hotel, they are nothing compared to what we could have together. Come, let's go, Teresita, please. Go ahead and roll to express your love passionately. So, right. are you playing Pasión de las Pasiones? I am! Plus one. Are you dressed to impress? Absolutely, I, I'm wearing a nice tux. It's cut just perfectly. Very nice. That's a nice feature of that move also, is it gets people to describe what they're wearing, and that's so important for Tellas. Uh, do they believe that you're single? Absolutely. All right, excellent. So go ahead and roll plus three. <sighs> Come on. Oh, I wish there was some kind of, like, oh, but plus three is good. I'll take it. Plus three is good. <laughs> Watch it be two. <sighs> I rolled a six, but three makes it a nine. <gasps> okay, excellent. So on a hit, your target gives themselves to you or reveals a secret they probably shouldn't. She's clutching onto your shirt, and there's like a moment that she starts to lean in towards a kiss, and then stops, looks away for just the barest of seconds, and then says, He has my son. Juanito is my son, and I can't just walk away from him and at that moment the doors of the chapel slam open and senor rodriguez is coming into the room you can see he has his massive pistol shoved down the front of his pants and he's walking with just this air of confidence and danger what do you do i turn to step in front of teresita protectively senor rodriguez masuno this wedding is a farce. She does not love you. She will never be happy with you. She's only marrying you because you hold her son. Very nice. All right. Uh, that is going to affect our move. Reveal a shocking truth. Yeah, and I'm doing this like out loud in front of the family, standing at the end of the aisle, like all of it as loud as possible. Yes. Uh, oh, crap. That's a flashback. How can I make this happen? Okay, I, I want to hit this move. It's This is a move that can be a little hard to hit, uh -huh. like early in a session. And so I want to hit it if we can, just because we got this little time. Let's do it. So this is a flashback move. So how that works is you flash back to reveal something about a character. Okay. And right now, it sounds like you're, you are putting it all on the line, right? Mm-hmm. And so what I want you to do is give us a quick flashback that shows how you know that this is a plot. Like, that you knew it was a plot even before you knew that Juanito was Teresita's son. Uh, yes, so we flash back to a moment where we see Juanito. We know because he's wearing kind of the same color palette that we have just seen Teresita in. Perfect. And we know that it's also a flashback because Senor Rodriguez, uh, he has a little bit of like this perfectly sculpted five o'clock shadow but he's clean shaven mm. now here at the wedding so that's how we know that some this is some time ago and we see unamas he's outside he's tilling some of the land just outside of, of this room in the hotel and he sees senor rodriguez he sees the jefe grab juanito by the arm twist it and say you will stay here you will stay here because otherwise i will kill you little boy you're my guarantee. Perfect. So, yeah, the audience had seen that in the past, but they didn't understand it. And, like, you didn't understand. Now it's all coming together. So you're going to mark a condition, okay. which I've realized we don't actually have your conditions. What emotion do you want to have? What emotion? I think the condition of driven sounds... Perfect. Sounds rough because it's going to make it harder for me to express love. Yes. But better at spotting something. So yes, yeah, so you've That's marked true. a condition. You've marked your condition of driven, and now you roll with your number of conditions marked. So it's just a plus one. Okay. Oof. This is scary. Here we go. It's plus one forward. This should be. Ha ha ha! Yeah. I rolled well. I rolled a ten. That's an eleven. Oh, perfect. So when I hit the news is staggering. Before acting against you, they must act with desperation, and you choose two. You have unequivocal evidence that this is true. The shocking truth gives you rightful claim to something they value, or you introduce a shocking new character who has your back. 
Ooh, ooh, okay, okay, here we go. The shocking truth. This is a lot of narrative pressure I've put on you because this is like a this is definitely a later game move. It's good though. I love <laughs> and it. And we were like ten minutes. Let's make it happen. Sweet. So he says, "You have to give Juanito to me because he is my son." Perfect. That is the shocking truth. It gives me rightful claim to something that he quote unquote values. Yeah. And then the unequivocal evidence that this is true is that I say, I know where you're keeping him, where you have imprisoned my son. Perfect. Senor Rodriguez takes a step back. There's just a look of disgust and anger on his face. And you can see that him hesitate. He's reaching for the gun, but he's thrown off. And the whole crowd, obviously, is freaking out this child is their blood right because the family's all there Mm -hmm. but rodriguez is standing there he's got his guys behind him and they're just waiting on him to make a move but he's he's frozen for a second because things are just falling apart before him i'm charging him i will tackle him and down get down before he draws this gun because i know he's a weak man he will use a gun to solve his problems perfect go ahead and strike out at someone with voice or violence all right so uh, are you playing pasiones pasiones i am plus one have you caught them off guard i think so i think so too have they just wronged you Oh, he's trying to take my love from me, so I think yes. Sounds good. I'll accept it. So that's a plus three. Oof, I rolled a seven, but plus three makes it a ten. Okay. So on a hit, your strike lands and you each mark a condition. On a ten plus, you can also take something from them or avoid marking a condition. Oh, I will take that gun from him. Oh, incredible. All right. And what else are you marking? Yeah, I have to mark... Uh... I'm using the conditions from El Caballero because I think that's the closest to Uno Mas. Cool. So I think I'm going to go with obsessed as the condition that I mark. I'm driven and obsessed. Nice. Obsessed is plus one to accuse someone of lying and minus two to face certain death, which hopefully doesn't come to that. So you tackle him to the ground and you get hold of the gun and there's just stillness. Teresita starts walking up the aisle. She has this beautiful bouquet of roses in front of her. She just stands next to you and is glaring down at Senor Rodriguez, and she's starting to shake. What do you do? The camera picks up that during the tussle, my tie on my tuxedo was loosened, as well as a couple of the top buttons. And so you can see just just a peek of the luxurious chest hair that I have and the the cut of the pecs there. Just just a hint of that. Oiled. Yes, of course. Yeah. Lightly. Uno Mas holds the gun up. It's a threat, but he's not pointing it at anyone. Teresita, go get on the motorcycle. Jefe, let's go get my son. Amazing. Wow, that was amazing, Brandon. Thank you so much for giving me a taste of this. Uh, You're really good at running this game. I've I've heard that there are good GMs like this Lowell Francis guy, but (laughs) you are pretty darn good at this. Thank you so much. I... I had such an amazing time just being on the show and playing with you. And I hope we get a chance to play again because yes. I want to see where you would take this. I mean, <laughs> uh... <laughs> so Passion is on Kickstarter right now as this episode yes. comes out. It is all, you fully funded in like, I don't know, a blink of an eye. I, th- I saw the Twitter notification from Magpie. I went there. It was already funded. Amazing. Do you have any really cool stretch goals or aspects of the Kickstarter that you want to highlight for folks that are listening to this? Sure. Uh, in a, So first off, the quick start is up there. You can play this game today. Go and download it. It's absolutely beautiful. Miguel Espinosa did an incredible job laying it out, and it's gorgeous. We also have a whole bunch of stretch goals that we've hit already. I'm actually struggling right now because I have like a certain amount of stretch goals that I think we're going to get to. Mm -hmm. And like one more than that in terms of ideas that I want to make. So if people can get out there and back this thing and move it up so I've got an excuse to add another beyond what we think we're going to be able to. That'd be that'd be so good. <laughs> Very cool. You heard that, everybody. Give this thing a look. The quick start free of charge. Drive through. Mm-hmm. You can grab that thing. It is gorgeous because uh, Miguel Espinosa is amazing. He's an incredible layout artist. And Brendan found some beautiful art for it. Spent a lot of time looking at a lot of very interactive people on stock art sites, and it I feel like it fits together so nicely. I love it. 
Cool. Well, thank you again for coming on Plus One Four, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me. It was truly an honor. It's been such an exciting time. Thank you. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community Richard Rogers and Rach Schalke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aro Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aro Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com. Hey listeners, Jason here. I want to let you know that Brindlewood Bay is now available in the Gauntlet $6 Patreon feed. Brindlewood Bay is a Powered by the Apocalypse game about a group of elderly women solving murder mysteries in and around the namesake town. As they investigate these crimes, they become increasingly aware of the activities of a dark cult called the Midwives of the Fragrant Void, and will have to come up with a plan to stop them. The game is basically Murder, She Wrote meets The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and we think you're going to love it. Your $6 pledge in February gets you everything you need to play Brindlewood Bay. The core rules, including a file for printing them as a zine, character sheets and other play aids, plus five mysteries. Dad Overboard, All Hollows Scream, The Great Brindlewood Bay Bake Off, Jingle Bell Shock, and A Murder Most Mucky. So head over to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet and make a $6 pledge to get Brindlewood Bay. Keep your pledge active and you'll also get new issues of our magazine codex every month. Thanks.